Welcome back, everybody. So I'm just gonna blast off today because we have a lot to do, some cool things to look at. So um, today we're gonna implement our first sorting algorithm. Uh, we're also gonna go back and look at um, our last little glimpse of trees before we move on from trees for the remainder of the semester. Um, there's a new feature of Java, Java's type system that we're gonna introduce today. Um, so it's gonna, be, it's gonna be fun. All right, so let's start by doing a little warm-up problem on trees. So this is, remember I said before that, you know, when you start to learn how to write recursive algorithms, I mean, recursive algorithms are very cool, right? I mean, there's a, there's a real high degree of elegance that you can achieve uh, sometimes when you choose to approach a problem in a recursive manner, break it into smaller pieces, solve the smallest problems, combine the results together. But it's important to remember that there's no problem that you can solve with a recursive algorithm that you can't solve with an iterative algorithm. And there's no problem that you can solve with an iterative algorithm that you can't solve with a recursive algorithm. So they're completely complementary to each other. So I think a good way to convince you of this is to essentially flatten a tree. So we use a tree to store a bunch of values. And in some ways, some of the programs that we've written that run on trees, like if I'm looking for a value, say I'm searching for a value in a tree, I can write that program to run on a list as well. And so you might wonder, like, why am I storing the values in a tree? Well, when we start to look at binary search trees, we see, okay, now I've got some additional structure in the tree that allows me to get uh, log n performance for search, which is kind of cool. Um, but let's, let's just demonstrate to ourselves that anything I can do uh, with the tree, I can do with the list by actually taking a tree and converting it to a list. And this is pretty similar to a homework problem you guys did uh, on Wednesday. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. As usual, we're gonna design uh, a recursive, this is a tree traversal algorithm. So this is gonna visit every node in the tree and add it to a list. When we're done, we're gonna have a list that contains all the values that were in the, in the original tree, and then it's possible that we could use that list to do other things. Like, let's say we wanna find the smallest value in the tree or the largest value in the tree. We could take the tree, put all the values into a list, sort the list, and then we would know the answer to some of these questions, okay? All right, so the base case here is, you know, as usual, I've reached an empty tree. If I've reached an empty tree, I don't have any nodes in that tree that I need to add to my list, so I'm good. The recursive step is, as usual, I'm gonna consider my right and left subtree separately. So in order to make sure that every node ends up, every value at every node ends up in this list, I have to add all the values to my right subtree, all the values to my left subtree, and all the values to my right subtree, all right? And the way I combine the results together is I use this list. So I'm adding myself to the list, and then I make sure that all my children in my left tree have a chance to add themselves, and all the children in the right tree have a chance to add themselves. So this is a case where, you know, again, the, the skeleton of this algorithm that we've been writing, these programs we've been running on trees is pretty similar. But this is a case where, it's kind of interesting, the way that we're gonna combine the results is we're actually gonna create a list in the wrapper function, and then we're gonna pass that list down as we recurse into the tree. Um, and the way that we combine the results is essentially by modifying this list. Okay. So let me just pause and, and uh, talk about this data structure. You guys have actually already implemented these. Um, lists are a tremendously useful data structure. Um, you know, you can get a lot done. You know, I, I used to tell people, and I still think this is actually true, you can get a lot done as a computer scientist with just two data structures. One is a list, and the other is something called a map that we will talk about in a few weeks, all right? Uh, lists are incredibly useful. If you don't understand how to use lists and maps, there's a lot of really important, high-impact, real-world problems that you can work on and solve. That's kind of all you need, right? Fancier data structures come in handy, you know, in certain places and stuff like that, but particularly for building prototypes um, and for solving a lot of problems that really have a lot of real-world impact, you don't need a lot of fancy data structures, right? You can get by with lists and, and maps. All right, so we've implemented these together, so you have some idea of how they work, but as, you know, when you go out into the real world as a programmer, your typical approach when you need to use a data structure should not be to implement it. It's not a good idea. And in fact, it's such a bad idea that if you do that in a job or whatever, people are going to be concerned. Um, because look, you're not the first person in the world who wants to use a list. And people have been working on lists for a long time, and there are existing list implementations. This is true of trees and pretty much every data structure you can think of 
has a good reference implementation in pretty much every programming language you can think of. And unless you're taking a course where they're, uh, you're implementing these for fun to learn how they work, you should just grab the ones that are already there. So in Java, these are in, uh, these packages, um, ArrayList and LinkedList. And ArrayList is the one that people tend to use, okay? Now, here's, but here's another place where we're going, we're going back and we're, we're, we're introducing or refreshing this concept of interfaces. Because you can use, so I could write this a little bit differently down here. Here what I've done is I've created two list reference variables. So I've got a list reference variable called list, and I've got a refer list reference variable called another list. List in Java is an interface. It's an interface that both ArrayList and LinkedList implement. List has those functions that you implemented before, get, set, add, remove, as well as a bunch of other useful things. Okay, so ArrayList and LinkedList represent two different implementations of the same interface. Now, by, ca by taking the right side where I'm creating the new object and then casting it to a list, you might wonder, why am I doing this? I could just have list on line five be an ArrayList reference, and I could have another list on line six be a LinkedList reference. But the nice thing is, if I use list, if later I want to switch between an ArrayList and a LinkedList, I can do that very easily without changing a lot of my code. Okay, so let's actually use these to solve our problem. Here's the list, as I promised, let's say list interface um, in Java, and there's something about this that you don't understand yet. That thing in the, the triangle brackets, we will get there in a couple of weeks. In fact, we'll start talking about that today. That's a feature of Java's type system known as generics that allows me to create containers that hold specific kinds of objects without knowing what kinds of objects um, they are actually going to hold. All right, so here again, I can create two different types of lists, and if I wanted to, because the list reference, my, because my list reference is an interface type, it can hold either an array list or a linked list. If I make, so, here, so here's what people do. You know, I had a colleague who was like, oh yeah, you know, I just always use array lists. Now the problem is, if later in my code, I realize that the problem I'm solving would be better served, my code would run faster with the linked list, I can't switch, and I'm stuck. So I would always suggest that you use, whenever you're using a list, have your reference types be list types, not array list types. All right, so let's solve this problem that we, we posed. So what I wanna do is I have a tree, and I wanna put all the values into a list, okay? Um, what I'm gonna do in my all values function is a lot of times our wrapper functions have just immediately called into the private function and started it on the root node. Here I'm actually going to use the, the chance to create my list. So I'm gonna say list values, so I'm allocating a reference variable of type list, and I'm gonna create a new, and let's just use an array list for now. I could use a linked list, so let's use an array list. We actually go back and switch it in a minute, and I'll show you how easy that is. And then I'm gonna call all values, and I'm gonna start it on the root node and I'm gonna pass it this list of values. So now my private wrapper function looks like this. Uh, takes a current node, and then a list of values. Okay, and then, so what's my base case? When do I stop? I always wanna start with the base case. How do I make sure that, what's the, what's the point at which I've reached the smallest problem? Yeah. Well, my node is null, so at that point I have an empty tree, right? So if current is equal to null, there is no nodes here, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna return the list that I was passed. I don't wanna modify it because there's no node here to add. Otherwise, I've gotta do three things. I've gotta make sure that I put my own value in this list, and then I have to also make sure that my right subtree, my left subtree, and my right subtree both have a chance to do that as well. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say values.add current.value. That, if I remember correctly, puts it at the end of the list. I could also put it at the front, but it doesn't matter. I didn't say that we had to put the list into the, I didn't say we had to put values into the list in any order, okay? Now I'm gonna do, I'm gonna restart all values on my right child. I'm gonna pass it the list, and then I'm gonna restart all values on my 
left child and pass it the list. And then I'm gonna return the list that now has my value, all the values from my left subtree, all the values from my right subtree. All right, let's see how this works. Let's see if this works, okay. That seems to work. Let's put some additional nodes in here. Um, let's make sure it works for an empty list. Good, okay. Questions about this example? We could probably make this a little bit cleaner, a little simpler. Anybody wanna make a suggestion how to modify this slightly? It's a, it's a small tweak that I think might, might allow it to make a little bit more, might make it a little cleaner, might help it make a little more sense. Any suggestions? It's not, I mean, this is, this is pretty good as it is. So, so here's what I might try. So here's what's interesting about this. So the wrapper function is the one that creates the list. It then passes a reference to the list to the, the private function, right? But what if I did this? I could essentially start my wrapper function on and hand it the list that I created. And then when the wrapper function returns, that means that all the nodes in the tree have been visited and they've all been added to the list. And then I can return the list that I still have a reference to. So what this allows me to do is make my wrapper function return void. So it doesn't actually need to return the list. It just needs to make sure that it passes the list to the right and left subtree so they get a chance to add their nodes. So again, a little, little bit cleaner. And we'll try the same thing. Any questions about this? Or before we go on. So again, so now what I've got is I've got all the nodes in a list, right? So let's say I wanted to, you know, figure out if there was a, a particular value in, in my tree, right? So we've already done search, right? But what I could do is I could say list values is binary tree all values, and then I could say for um, integer i in values, um, you know, if i is equal to eight, I'll print, no, come on. Oh, yeah, right, okay, so this is, this is gonna be, let's see here. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll come back and fix this in a, in a few slides. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a problem with the list that we're getting back. So there's a list of objects, right? All right, let me, let me, so, you know, let me talk, uh, we, we pointed out a minute ago that if I, instead of using array list references, if I use list, re list references, I can change this really uh, easily, and I can. So let's instead use a linked list to store our values. Um, and it works fine. Yeah, so essentially this is the nice thing about using interface reference variables rather than tying them to specific implementation, right? I don't need to know how the list works. I just need to be able to add items to it, right? All I really, all this code really needs to know about values is that I can add an item to it. That's the only thing we're doing. So both array lists and link lists and whatever other fancy, I think there's something called a tree list uh, that stores things internally in a tree. Um, all of them are gonna are gonna behave the same way from our perspective. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good, that, that, that's a great question. So um, it depends, so, so can anyone answer this question? Yeah. Yeah, so essentially this tree uh, is built randomly. So if you look here, when I add, so one is always gonna be the root node, because it's the first node. But then when I add two, half the time two is gonna go on the right side of one, and half the time it's gonna go on the left side of one, okay? And if you look at my algorithm, my algorithm always adds the nodes from the right side first, right? And then the left side. So about half the time it finds two on the right side, half the time it finds two on the left side. Does that make sense? Yeah, and if we run, if we run this a bunch of times, we'll see that, you know, over time, I suspect that about, well, 
it's like it's less determined, less even than I would want. But I think about half the time you would expect this to be one five two, and the other time one two five. Great question. Other questions about this before we before we go on? All right. So, so last time we introduced sorting as an algorithmic challenge, as an exciting, interesting problem with really deep roots and something that's the building block for a lot of things. So today we're gonna look at our first sorting algorithm, it's called insertion sort. Um, we'll start talking about merge sort at the end of class today, assuming I don't run out of time. Um, in lab next week, you guys are gonna chance to work on selection sort, um, and on Monday we'll come back and talk about quick sort. So merge sort and quick sort are really cool because they're both examples of recursive sorting algorithms and ones that have really interesting trade-offs. Um, so today's sorting algorithm is also kind of fun, uh, but it's an iterative sorting algorithm, um, sort of a warm-up for us. All right, so let's talk about insertion sort. All right, so here's, here's the main idea behind insertion sort. Here's my array of unsorted values, all right? Again, we're sorting arrays, we're sorting arrays of integers, um, and we're gonna sort them in ascending order. But we could sort, we can sort arrays of anything, anything that we can compare to values, um, and we could sort them in either order if we want. But just for the sake of simplicity, this is gonna be our default setting. So the, what, what insertion sort tries to do is in every step of the algorithm, it tries to increase, so it starts at the left, and it builds a sorted part of the list or of the array. So right now, that sorted part is empty, okay? And what I, insertion sort does and is every step of the algorithm, it makes that part of the list that's sorted one item bigger. And it does that by taking the item from the right side of the unsorted section and moving it into place in the sorted section. So I can start, now here's the thing. So I can start with eight, right? Now when we implement this, we're gonna allow the sorted section to start with one value in it because an array that has one value is already sorted, right? So now what I need to do is I need to take five and I need to put five into the sorted part of the array. So in order to maintain the sortedness of the first part of the array, I had to put five before eight, okay? So again, now my sorted section has two values in it. My unsorted section has the remaining six. And I continue this process. So now I take seven, and I move seven into the sorted part of the array. Okay, so seven needs to go in between five and eight. Now I'm gonna take three. Three is gonna go all the way back at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna take four. Four, you know, finds the right spot. I'm gonna take 11. 11 stays put. 11 is the largest value, so it turns out it was already in the right spot. Um, I'm gonna take six. Six ends up kind of smack in the middle. And then my last step requires taking 11 and moving it all the way across the formation, okay? So every step of the algorithm, conceptually, for this is why it's called insertion sort. I take one value and I insert it into the sorted part in the right spot, okay? So, you know, again, in each step, just go back a few. Here I took six. I inserted six into the array in the right spot. Here I took negative one, I inserted negative one into the array in the right spot. If I continue this process, obviously the sorted part of the array is getting bigger by one every step, so it's gonna take n steps to finish the job. Now the question becomes, though, how long does each step take? So again, this is not an O-N algorithm. There are n steps that I have to run. We might start to think about how many comparisons do I have to uh, perform to figure out where a particular value goes? Okay. So now let's look a little bit more carefully. Oh, I think, yeah, so this is just another version of this, kind of showing you where the sorted item ended up, right? So here, now it ends up here. Great. So now let's look at a single step. Okay, so that's the outer operation of the algorithm. Now let's look at the single step of inserting a value into the right place, okay? So let's say here my sorted part of the array has six values in it, it's in blue. I have item six that I'm trying to insert into that sorted section. So remember, I know that the blue values are sorted, and I'm gonna use that in my algorithm to know when to stop. 
but I don't know where six should go, right? So what essentially what I have to do, and what, how our implementation is gonna work, is I'm gonna start six where it is right now, and I'm gonna start moving it to the left. And every time I do that, I'm gonna compare it with that value. So essentially my first step is to compare 11 and six. And I say, is 11 bigger than six? Is six less than 11, right? If that's the case, then these two values are out of position, right? Six should go in front of 11. So actually, the way that our, um, algorithm is gonna be implemented is we're gonna swap them, right? So I'm gonna swap six and 11, because six needs to go to the left. Now I repeat the same process. I compare six and eight, and I say, is six less than eight? The answer is yes. So eight needs to move to the right, six needs to move to the left. I keep doing this. I compare six and seven. Is six less than seven? Yes. So again, seven goes to the right, six comes to the left. Finally, I get to the next value in the sorted section, which is five. Now I say, is six less than five? No. Now I found the right spot. So now I can stop, and that's where I'm going to insert six. Okay? So again, this step of the algorithm is exploiting the fact that the uh, blue part of the array has already been sorted. Because if, if, you know, the fact it's already been sorted means that as soon as I find a value that's equal to or less than six, I know where to put it, right? I know where it belongs. I found that spot of the array. Okay. Questions about this, actually, before we give it a try. Do our first sorting algorithm and then we'll do some analysis on it. Yeah. Why would you go from left to right? Um, so the, let's go back and look at our other diagram. And, you know, this is, this is an arbitrary decision, right? So the way that we're going to implement insertion sort, the sorted part starts at the left and grows to the right. You could implement it where it started at the right and grew to the left, at which point you would take a value and move it right, right? But the idea is that the, um, in any step, the next value that we want to insert is the first value in the unsorted section. And it needs to go into the sorted section. Now, we could start it from the right, too, right? You could actually do that. When you're swapping values, it's easier to start it in place, right? Yeah, so essentially, uh, the way this works internally, you guys will see this in a minute, is I swap, when I'm, when I'm moving four, I swap eight and four, I swap four and seven, I swap four and five, and then I stop. So I'm essentially, I'm moving values by exchanging them. Yeah, great question. So there's, there's several different ways to implement this. You can implement it where the sorted section grows from the left and you move values from the right. You can implement it where the sorted section grows from the left and you move values from the left and all of the other combinations, right? I think to me this is sort of makes most sense, but other uh, versions of it may be more intuitive to you. Great question, other questions? All right, let's give this bad boy a try. This is always the time of year where I do some practice before class, because these are tricky. All right, so let's do the easy part first. Let's um, check for bad inputs. So if I have a null array, I'm just gonna return null. There's nothing I can do with that in an array. Um, otherwise, so let's go back here and, and think about how a single step works, right? So my outer loop is essentially the, the, um, the place where I'm growing the sorted part of the array, okay? So remember, the outer step of the algorithm is growing the sorted part of the array one value at a time. And I'm gonna start not with zero, but with one, right, because the first, if, if I ignore the first value, what I'm doing is I'm starting with the sorted section that has one value, and that's already sorted, right? This also means that if you ask me to sort an empty array, or an array with only one value in it, my implementation is going to stop very quickly because it doesn't have anything to do. If you ask me to sort an empty array, I'm never gonna enter the loop at all, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna start my, um, so now I'm gonna start my j um, value, and I'm gonna start j at value i. I could start it at i minus one, that's 
let's, let's start it at i. Actually, I need to start at i, so I'm gonna start j at i, right? I'm, I'm moving this index back towards the beginning. So I'm taking the value at j, and I'm gonna want to move it back towards zero as far as it needs to go. So whatever, so the, 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 the unsorted value is the value at j. And I wanna move it back to the left. I'm going to continue this as long as j is greater than zero, and I'm gonna decrement j each time. And I'll show you why greater than zero in a minute. All right, so here's the two, and, and it's useful to think about this when, when, when at the first time we go through. Let's, uh, let's imagine we're just thinking about the first two values. So the first time we go through, i is equal to one, okay? I start j at one. The two values I wanna compare are the values that index one and the values that index zero, okay? And what I wanna do is I wanna say if input array j minus one is greater than input array j, then I need to swap them. So what this means is if the value to the left, the value to the left is greater than the value to the right, I need to swap the two. I've got, a, I've got two values in my array that are out of place. So eventually when I sort my array, and if I went through and I compared every pair of values, the value on the left would always be less. The value with the smaller index would always be less than the one next to it, less than or equal to. It would never be greater. So if I find one where it's greater, I found two values that are out of position. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna swap them. And this is just a standard swap that I think, you know, we looked at earlier in the semester. So in order to make sure that I, what I wanna do is swap array j minus one and array j. In order to do that, I need a temporary variable so I don't lose the value, in this case, of array j minus one. So I create my temporary variable, I set it to j minus one. I overwrite j minus one with j, and then I set j to my temporary variable, which stores the original value of input array j minus one. Okay, so let's see if this actually works. Ah, look at that, pretty nice. Now, here's the other thing, though. Let me go back, there's, there's one thing that we need to do here uh, in order to make this, uh, make sure that we get the performance that we want here, right? So let's go back and look at our algorithm. So remember what we did. So essentially what we've just implemented is this step, where we're taking the first value from the unsorted part of the array, and we're moving it left, comparing it against its neighbor, until we find the spot where it stops. So here, and then we're gonna insert. So what can we add here that represents so there's this, so we have the part where we're moving it over. But what else can we put in here that will make it run a little faster and represent the point where it's like I know where it goes, right? So essentially the code inside the, um, the loop is what's doing the swapping, right? And at some point, if I'm not swapping it, what can I do? Let's go back to our diagram again. So here, after I do the insertion, I don't keep going. I don't need to look at, examine five and four in four and three, right? I know they're already sorted, okay? So what can I add to my insertion sort to receive? Yeah, let's put a break statement down here. This is dangerous, let's see if this still is gonna work. So essentially I'm saying, if the two items are out of order, then I need to keep shifting the unsorted item to the left because it's not in the right spot yet. But if the two items are in order, I've entered the sorted part of the array and I'm done. I don't need to keep going all the way to the beginning. All right, so let's try this to make sure it still works. It does, okay, cool. Any questions about this? This is like good, you know, I know you guys you know, we started off with this imperative programming and we wrote some kind of gnarly stuff and now it's like you, you, we've seduced you with objects for, uh, you know, the, the middle of the semester and you didn't have to write any complicated imperative code and it's back. Yeah, so insertion sort, selection sort, you know, uh, these are, can be tricky to, to think about. Any questions about this? Yeah. 
Ah, OK. Well, let's come. So the question was, is there a better way to do it than n squared? And the answer is yes. Uh, but let's come back and, and talk about that in a minute. Yeah, great question. First of all, let's think about what the performance of this algorithm actually is, OK? So what I want to do here is I want to count the number of swaps that I have to do. And before I return, I'll just print off the number of swaps that I did, OK? So here, to sort the array, required 18 swaps. All right? Let's make the array one item bigger. Now it requires 22. Let's make it, let's put another item back in there. Now it requires 23. Well, these are ones that go at the end. That's the problem. Let me put one like this, right? Now it requires 26. Put something like that. 35. Yeah, so how many values in the array? It looks like I have um, 10 now, and it's taking me 35 swaps to get through to get through the problem, right? So what is the time complexity of this algorithm, right? So what's the worst case? Let's go back and think about our array and one step. So remember, my insertion step stops as soon as it finds the right spot. So what's the worst case for the insertion step? Remember, I started at the right, and I keep swapping, keep swapping, keep looking for the spot to insert it, and at some point, yeah. Yeah, if I have a value that belongs at the beginning of the array, meaning it's the smallest value in the array, then I have to drag it all the way over to the left side, okay? All right, so if that's the worst case for insertion, that step, what's the worst case input for insertion sort? So again, if we go back here, and let's go, let's, let's go back to an eight item array. If I give you eight values to put in here, and your job is to make insertion sort take as long as possible, what eight values are you gonna put in? There's actually lots of choices, but how are, what's going to be true about that, those eight values? Yeah. They're in opposite order. Yeah. So let's try that. Let's do eight, seven, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. 28. Yeah. It's as bad as it gets. Because every time I go through, I've got to take that value and I've got to move it all the way to the left, all the way to the left, all the way to the left, right? If I take any of these and swap them, let's try putting four here and five here, then I get 27, right? I, got, I made it a little bit better, but the worst it can be is 20. Algorithm works, but it takes a long time. Okay, so what about the best case input? Right, so now let's think about my insertion step again. Yeah. Yeah, if it's already sorted. Okay, so now let's do this. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I didn't know swaps. Zip. Right, because every time I went through the array and I picked the unsorted, it was on the right spot. Right, never had to do any work. You know, and again, if I make this slightly out of order, right, think just do this, I got one swap, right, the rest of it was in order, okay. So, worst case is O n squared, if the array is sorted in reverse order. And again, there's, a, there's some constant factors here that I'm ignoring, so for example, it's not exactly O n squared because um, it's, I only have to move it one, I only have to do one swap the first time, two swaps, three swaps, four swaps, right? But that outer loop is running n times, and the inner loop starts out running one and ends up running n, so the inner loop is running like n over two. And so it's really n squared over two, all right? The best case is if the array is already sorted, all right? Um, average case, you know, again, this is one of those places where it really depends on the data, but typically what you see quoted for uh, insertion sort is O n squared. 
That's if I give it random inputs, right? Not worst case, not backwards, not best case, not sorted, um, but. Now here, but here's the thing that's cool about insertion sort. I want you to remember this, because really none of the sorting algorithms that we talk about in this class are worthless. They all have some value. The good thing about insertion sort is that it's fast when the array is already sorted. So let's say you have some data and you're pretty sure it's sorted, but you just want to run it through a sorting algorithm to be sure insertion sort is a good choice for that. Because if the array is already sorted, it's very fast, okay? The algorithm we start talking about in a few minutes, a recursive sorting algorithm called merge sort, does not have that property. It's always n log n, even if the array is already sorted, okay? So insertion sort does nicely there. The other nice thing about insertion sort is that it doesn't consume a lot of extra space. So if you go back here to our implementation, essentially I have one extra temporary variable here, and if I want to be clever about this, I can actually move the declaration of the temporary variable outside of the array. Outside of the loop, sorry. So now I have one temporary variable, that's it. The rest of the work is being done inside the original array. Right? And again, when we look at merge sort and we look at quick sort, uh, we're gonna see worse space complexity. They require more computer memory to do the same task. Merge sort, sorry, insertion sort is just like, just give me one temporary variable and I'm good, right? All right, so we're gonna start filling out this big chart and we'll keep coming back to it when we look at merge sort and we look at quick sort and stuff like that. But this is our summary for uh, insertion sort. Now, I think I mentioned this last time, but we know that we can do better than this, right? Particularly this average and worst case performance. Sorting algorithms, you can prove, should do no worse than O n log n, right? And so if you find a sorting algorithm that has O n squared behavior in the average or worst case, you know that it's not optimal, right? Um, so we know that there are better alternatives out there. Okay. Let me, um, let me do a brief, very brief digression into Java generics, um, just to sort of start to seed your mind for things that are gonna come downstream. All right, and this is actually the reason that we had this problem earlier. So again, you're gonna use lists, because lists are super useful, right? We're also gonna use maps and other built-in Java data structures in the future. However, lists have this problem that we observed actually a few minutes ago, and I just decided not to solve because I was uh, excited to get to show you this here, okay? So here's the problem. The way that we've been using lists right now, we, had, we have not told Java what type of objects we're gonna put in them. And so essentially what we're using is a list of, can you guys just not have an ongoing conversation during class? I can hear, I can hear it. Distracted. All right, so the list that I've created on line six is a list of objects. So here's what happens. When I add that string to the list, Java upcasts it to an object. So on line 10, when I try to pull it out, Java won't downcast it for me, because it's sort of forgotten about what kind of object it is. It says, well, what you put in was an object reference. That's all I know about it. So when I get it out, it's now an object reference. And that's not very useful, right? Now again, what you can do if you know what's in the list is that you can do an explicit cast, right? And then I could print off the value. But what if you put something into the list that's not a string? Now I get this runtime error, which is really gross, okay? So you, you might remember like a month ago, we talked about the fact that one of the things that we've been trying to do to build better programming languages is allow the compiler to check more things for you when the code is being compiled. When you compile the code, not when it runs. Because you compile the code as part of your development process, right? You compile the code before you can even run the app. You compile the code before you run the program. 
okay? So if the compiler catches an error, no one is ever going to see it because your program isn't even created. My Java is like, I'm not even gonna build that program because I know it has a problem, right? So the more things we can c catch when we're compiling our code, the better, right? And here's a place where we would like the compiler to be more helpful. Right now, all the compiler knows is that there are objects in this list. Doesn't know what kind they are because we didn't tell it what kind of objects we wanted to put in the list. So here's how we do that. And it's another bit of syntax, unfortunately, uh, for you guys to, to learn and start to use. Um, it's in this, it's this uh, triangle bracket notation. So again, this is a new thing. What this is, is this is a generic, what's called in Java, generic type. So instead of a reference to a list, my first variable, integer list, is a reference to a list that is going to be used to store integers. That's what I'm telling Java. I'm saying, I'm gonna use this list to store integers. I can also store anything that I can upcast to an integer, but I know that anything I put into this has to be an integer or something that descends from integers. Same thing here. Now I'm creating something that's gonna hold strings, okay? I need that type both on the reference variable and when I create these containers. So you'll see that I have this triangle bracket notation on the left, it says this reference variable refers to a list that stores integers, and on the right, I tell the ArrayList class, this ArrayList is gonna be used to store integers. And the second time I have an ArrayList that's gonna be used to store a string. Okay? Here's what's cool, here's what's nice about this, okay? Is that now if we pull stuff out, um, uh-oh, it's angry with me. Um, Maybe this, one is, maybe this example isn't gonna work yet. I'll fix it after class, all right? But now if we put things out that are strings, they're gonna come back as strings. Actually, let me go back to this example, because this one worked, right? All right, so let's say, let's make this a list of strings. So he here's, there's two good things that are gonna happen here. One is that the compiler can now help, right? Because the compiler knows that this list is only supposed to store strings. So when the compiler sees on line eight that I'm trying to add something to it that's not a string, the compiler is gonna complain. This is a compiler error. That's what I wanted. I wanted help from the compiler. So now if I put in something that's a string, like test, that's okay, and when I get things out from the list, they're also strings, all right? We are gonna use, I'm gonna give you guys some practice with this later, you guys are actually gonna use these to build some of your own generic classes. It's not that hard. Um, but I just wanted you to see them for now because this is pretty, this is pretty useful, right? That's a useful way when you're working with Java container types. Okay. So I think what I'll do is I think I'll defer the merge sort overview to Monday. Um, and instead what I wanna do is talk about our final project fair. So believe it or not, this is coming up. The semester has really flown by. So uh, MP4 is due next weekend. The first lab before Thanksgiving, we are gonna, sorry, the, the lab in the week before Thanksgiving, we're gonna start you up thinking about your final project. We wanted to get this started before Thanksgiving so you guys can partner up and, you know, find someone to work with and start thinking about what to do. And maybe if you get bored at home and, you know, you're tired of watching football or eating turkey or whatever you do, um, you can spend some time actually working on it if you want. All right, so here's the thing. Um, we're gonna have a fair, this is always fun. It's on reading day, okay? Uh, I haven't figured out exactly when. It's gonna be probably like mid-afternoon, kind of right before dinner. Uh, there's usually some food, don't tell anybody. Um, you do not have to participate in the final project fair. This is important to note, okay? I can't require it because it's on reading day. What I can do is I can give you 1% extra credit if you come and demo your, your app, okay? Um, and what we usually do is we take over like a big part of Siebel. So we'll probably have a bunch of the Siebel classrooms and spaces around the building. Okay, so why do we do this? Here's why. So all of you are gonna get a job. If you learn software development, if you learn computer science, you'll get a job. 
I promise you. All right? Not all of you are going to get a good job. Right? It used to be like 30 years ago, there were no bad jobs in tech. Everything was cool. Now, like someone has to, so there is somebody at Microsoft who has to maintain all this crappy legacy code, right? Um, and, you know, is that a good job in the sense, does it pay well, does it have good benefits, does it, you know, uh, produce a nice work-life balance? Yeah, it does. But is it exciting? Is it, like, cutting edge? Is it changing the world to, like, maintain Clippy or whatever the equivalent of Clippy is now? I don't know. Like, you decide. Um, if you don't want a good job, here's what to do. Here's how to get a job, but not a great job. Take your classes, you know, do the projects, get good grades. Do the MPs, whatever, you know. And then when you're standing in line at the career fair in a couple years, you and everybody else, the only thing that you'll have to brag about is that you got an A in 225. You know how many people get A's in 225? Like a lot. Okay? So this does not make you stand out, and this does not distinguish you or identify you as someone who has a passion for technology. Because all you've done during your academic career is the things that we made you do. You, you did the two, you know, you did 225 MP4 because we made you do it. You did the third MP checkpoint for 125 because we made you do it. That doesn't show that you're excited about the field, okay? If you want a great job in tech, the way to do it is to show your passion for technology. The things that we teach you in our courses should just be a springboard for you to then go out and learn more and find out more, right? And the goal of the project fair is to just hopefully light a little bit of a spark under some of you that will get you started doing that. So that then, when you're in the line to talk to Google, you can be like, hey, I built a bus app that's up on the App Store that's actually used by thousands of people, and I have paying customers. True story. Ben Nordic, that bus app started as a 125 final project. You can now use it. There's like a $5 paid version that has some sort of quest where you can track how many of the different bus stops you've visited. It sounds pretty cool. Um, all right, so I have the site up for you guys to look at in terms of what were, uh, the projects were from last year. You know. The bar for the final project is pretty low, but I know, because I've seen it before, that some of you guys will get sucked into this and get excited by it and do some really, really incredible things, all right? So this page is up to inspire you, not to intimidate you. Um, you know, as long as you try something, as long as you work together with your partner and don't turn in something that was clearly generated by watching a tutorial and copying the code from online, you are gonna get a good score on the final project. The grading is very generous. Right? But again, our hope is that this starts something for you where you start to learn how to think independently, find your own problems, and also work in a team. Okay, I got nothing this weekend. I hope you guys have a fantastic one. It's supposed to warm up a little bit. Um, good luck with today's homework. It's the last one on trees, a little bit of a doozy. I hope you enjoy it. I will see you on Monday. <laughs>